The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings... Proverbs 6, 16. So the question is, why are these listed as the top sins in the Bible? There are many reasons, but from the viewpoint that we are studying, because these sins violate freedom the most the freedom of the of other individuals involved so we start here there are six things which the Lord hates in fact seven are an abomination to his soul verse 17 a proud look what is a proud look a proud look is arrogance in fact, pride is the first sin of Satan that caused his fall. And when Satan became proud in his mental attitude, it led to motivational type sin, which was to overthrow God. The same is true in the human race. For example, when David came under the sin of pride in the spring, when he was supposed to go to war, instead of hang around the castle, he hung around the castle. He put himself above God's law, thus put him himself above God. And as he remained in that state of, and that, by the way, was a detriment to Israel and a detriment to their freedom. And then, because he's acting as God now. This is what David's doing. And he continued to do so. And it would manifest itself overtly. Then we have the fact that he committed adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah the Hittite was one of the top men in David's army. And by doing so, he had put himself above God's law, thus putting himself above God and violating a concept of freedom, the freedom of Uriah the Hittite to have a wife. He stole his wife. And then, ultimately, that sin of pride motivated David to murder and murder is also listed as part of the top sin. So he put himself in the place of God and therefore thought it was his right to take over God's position and murder a man or men actually. Because when he put Uriah out in the front along with other men that were with him, it was a, a lot more than just Uriah who was killed. So David murdered and violated the freedom of Uriah the Hittite to live and violated the freedom of other men to live. 
and put the whole freedom of Israel into a compromised position. Pride. Because it's inevitable. Whenever you fall under the sin of pride, you're going to stick your nose into someone else's business and you're going to try to run the show because you are God. You might not say it that way, but you're definitely thinking of it in terms of I am the one in control. And every control freak out there thinks that they are God. Now, I'm not talking about the fact if you're in a position of management and have been delegated authority. That's under the laws of divine establishment. You are to exercise your authority within the boundaries of that institution where you work. But in normal life, if you have pride, you're going to stick your nose to someone else's business. You're going to try to run their life. You're going to talk about them, which is another case of a, a hey, look, we have a visitor, a little kitty at the door. Well, I guess he wants to listen to pretty little kitty. That's right. Don't, don't get filled with pride, cat because it'll mess you up. So we have a proud look. And that has to do with the sin of pride. You putting yourself in the place of God and as a result, you will manifest that by uh, getting involved in other people's business. And the sin of pride how do you know if you have it? Well, it, it includes a lot of things. If you are a bitter person, you're filled with pride. A jealous person. Are you jealous of someone else because of their ability, because of their looks, because they do something better than you? Or you could just be a jealous person all because of pride. And the jealousy will always manifest itself. Pettiness. If you run into a petty person, that person is jealous because pettiness is the little sister of jealousy. So we have jealousy, vindictiveness. That means you have a vengeful heart. You think you've been wronged, whether real or imagined, you will take revenge into your own hands. See, pride takes it out of God's hands. And you will seek revenge and you will violate the freedom of someone else. Implacability. Implacability simply means you are unwilling to forgive. We would say you hold a grudge. And some people have held grudges their entire lives against someone else. Why did they do so? You say it only hurts them. So why do they do it? Why are they implacable? Because this is how the weak try to control the strong through guilt manipulation. And far too often I've seen believers with more doctrine, strong believers, stronger than the ones who are attacking them compromise because of the guilt manipulation of a weak, pusillanimous, petty believer who is filled with pride. That's why I don't let it happen to me. That's why I take Colossians 2.16 which says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a holiday, or some type of festival, or the Sabbath day. Don't let them judge you. So I don't. I follow that verse very closely. And I do it because I know they're trying to violate my freedom by guilt manipulation. 
and I don't let it happen. So I don't even have to separate myself from legalists. They naturally separate from me because I'm not going to follow their nonsense. And they know it. And in their pride, they think it's okay to tell me what to do. But if I stand up and tell them how they're wrong and what the Bible says, then somehow I'm in violation. No, I'm not. I'm following Colossians 2.16. I'm not letting them get away with it. But far too often, believers stronger than the guilt manipulator compromise. They even take on the same vocabulary of the stupid. Thinking that somehow, by talking on their level of arrogance and stupidity, you're going to change their mind. No, you're not. They, evil will get you. You can't get evil. Only thing you can do is say no to it. Stand up in its face and say no. Give it the truth of doctrine and say no. You don't judge me. I've seen arrogant people all of my life, of course, and so have you. But I've seen them walk into someone's house who was enjoying a cigar and they had to tell that person, that stinks, that's nasty, that's bad for you. You are in their house. You keep your mouth shut, you rude, arrogant person. You person full of pride who has placed yourself in God's shoes and has walked into someone else's property and are telling them what to do in their own home. That's pride. And they're walking around like little gods, sticking their nose into everyone's business, trying to make them feel uncomfortable, trying to dictate to them what to do, and they feel justified in it, and somehow society now allows it. We have lost the concept of this country and it's because of believers of live and let live. And if you don't have a society that has the attitude of live and let live, then you lose your freedom. And this is all happening because of believers failing in their spiritual life. And if you don't make Bible doctrine number one every day you wake up in the morning, you don't make sure you take in Bible doctrine, and you don't make sure you try to stay in fellowship as much as possible, and if you don't make sure that you're applying Bible doctrine, you are a traitor to the United States of America, which is still a client nation to God on life support. And it's your fault! So you have a responsibility to God, and you have a responsibility to this magnificent client nation, or what once was a magnificent place. We're on the downtrend now. It's still magnificent, but we definitely have our problems and our issues because believers are pussyfooting around and not getting with the Word of God. They'd rather have their ears titillated on this Sunday or if they go to a mega church on a Saturday night. On a Saturday night, they had no money so they went to be entertained at the church, see, where they ask for 10%, of course, so they can have their big screen TVs, and they can have their large, obnoxious, loud bands play nonsensical music, blasphemous music oftentimes, and they lack knowledge. They made themselves through pride their own God and they lack knowledge. They want to be entertained. So a proud look is arrogance and that includes everything from bitterness to jealousy to vindictiveness to implacability to hatred to self-pity. You feel sorry for yourself? No need. You've been given the most magnificent spiritual life in all of human history. No dispensation will be given a spiritual life such as ours. And I don't care if you're laying on your deathbed in a lot of pain. No self-pity. 
You feel sorry for yourself. Well, people with pride do because the people around them aren't complying or they're unhappy. They want everyone around them to be unhappy and they're filled with self-pity. If everyone around them is not unhappy, then they get angry and filled with hatred. All of that is related to pride and you see how it violates the freedom of those who are in the periphery of the person filled with pride. So a proud look. Now I'm going to go as quickly as I can through this because it's Sunday. I would usually give two, but I'm going to give one. So it's going to be packed with verses and doctrine, and it's not going to be as leisurely. Then it'll go back to more leisurely Monday. So a proud look, a lying tongue. A lying tongue refers to the malicious gossip or the slanderer. What's the difference? The gossip could tell the truth about someone's sins or what they perceive to be sins or what they do that they think is wrong that may or may not be wrong. But they do it every time they gossip, they do it from a position of a malicious person. A lying tongue is a malicious person. And what is malice? The lust to hurt, the lust to degrade because it makes them feel better. Why? Because of pride again. It places them above the person they gossip about when they're far, far beneath that person in many cases. By the very fact that they're gossiping shows that they are beneath that person. And slander is simply making up things about the person. Oftentimes, you don't have to make up anything because everyone has an old sin nature. But it could be an exaggeration of what they are doing that you perceive as wrong or really is wrong. But God will take care of that. Who are you? Oh, that's right. You're God. I'm sorry. I forgot. In your pride, you said, I'm God, so I have this right to gossip and slander. You are involved in the worst of the sins. And what are you punished for? The mental attitude that's behind that gossip and slander. There's always a mental attitude behind it. Most of the time, it's the mental attitude of pride. I'm smarter than that person. I'm better than that person. That person doesn't do what I say. I will gossip about them. So first of all, you have the mental attitude sin behind it could be pride, which includes jealousy. You could be jealous of that person, so you try to bring them down. So you're judged for the mental attitude sin. Then you're judged for the verbal sin, which would be gossip or maligning. Doesn't matter. Each one carries a penalty. And then you're judged for the sin that you name of that person three times. That's why it's called triple compound discipline. And with but judgment you dish out, that means whatever name you sin of that person, let's say the person fornicated, and you gossip about them, malign about them, from the mental attitude of pride, you think you have a right to judge them when that's left to the purview of God. So then that's the first punishment, pride. Second punishment to the believer, the gossip and the maligning. The third punishment, fornication, the sin that you named for that person. And therefore, the person who actually committed fornication gets off scot-free. Why? Because you're acting as God, and God says, well, if you want to act like God, you've already dished out the punishment to that person. So I'm stepping out of your way. God's a gentleman. I'll let you act like God, but in the meantime, I'm going to hold you in contempt of court, and I'm going to beat you silly with triple compound discipline. And I've known of people who have gossiped and maligned a pastor. See, a pastor receives double the blessing and double the discipline. So when you malign and gossip about a pastor, 
you receive sextuplet compound discipline because the pastor is going already either going to be punched twice for what he does so now you're going to get punched twice and two times three is six and I've seen and heard of people who have died very quickly after gossiping and maligning against a pastor. Don't do it. I don't care if the pastor's right or wrong. They're the authority. And God has already set it up, the system, because they are in authority, that greater responsibility. The pastor gets, gets beat silly. When you step in the way of that, you're stepping in the way of a Louisville ball bat. And you do so because you say, get out of the way, God. I'll handle this guy. I'll bring him down. I'll mess with him. I'll make his life miserable. He deserves it. You know it. And I'm, I'll, act as, I'll act in your place. So a proud look, a lying tongue, and then hands that shed innocent blood. So you see here the three categories. Already we have Solomon or Proverbs David categorizing. We have the proud look, mental attitude sin, a lying tongue, verbal sin, murder, uh, the uh, sin of action, which is the uh, outward sin, the overt sin. And of course, hands that shed innocent blood does refer to murder. Murder is often motivated by jealousy, bitterness, which is all part of pride, implacability, hatred. And also that becomes the motivation for the verbal sins and the motivation for murder. All of these violate another person's freedom. And when you are living in this dispensation under the Royal Family Honor Code in which you are doing this against another priest, it even holds more weight. So this is the pattern for verse 17. It lists the three categories of sin, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, and overt sins. And we can notice that murder is the only overt sin listed among the top seven. We can also notice that fornication is not listed, which is an overt sin that is most often probably quoted. Uh, fornication and uh, alcohol abuse or drug abuse or some other overt sin is often talked about uh, far more often than any of these others because the people who are involved in talking about it are involved in the worst of sins. That's why our Lord said... Why are you trying to get a toothpick out of your brother's eye when you have a log in your own eye? What he was saying is, you're committing the worst of the sins and you're trying to get a toothpick out of your brother's eye because he sins too, just not in the same way. But he allows you freedom. That person may sin and rebound. And that person allows you complete freedom, but you don't allow that person freedom. So you're picking a piece of sawdust out of their eye when you should be trying to get the log out of your own eye. So that's why murder is listed as the only overt sin. And why? Murder deprives the individual of the right to live, the freedom to live given to him by God at birth. You've denied him the ultimate freedom to live. And it was given to him by God at birth with the spark of life, Nashama, that was given to him at birth by God. Did you give that person the spark of life? Can you give the spark of life? Then how dare you snuff it out? Through murder, that is. But that's what pride will lead to. Just look at David. 
David, a man after God's own heart, a greater believer than I will ever be, committed murder because of pride. Now he rebounded. That's why he's a greater believer than I'll ever be. Because he rebounded. Verse 18. A right lobe that devises evil conspiracies. Feet that run rapidly to evil. So conspiracies are involved as well. And conspiracies are the overt manifestation of pride. People getting involved in conspiracies, usually against authority. Why? These people are frustrated. And frustrated people always become conspiratorial. Just look at Egypt. They had a conspiracy against their king, Mubarak. And as things go, Mubarak was a good king for Egypt, as things go, is what I'm saying. He signed a peace treaty with Israel and he kept it. But he was getting old and they wanted something new. So they went out and they replaced Mubarak in a conspiracy and the mobs got involved. All of them frustrated because their economy wasn't doing so well. Well, neither is ours. That's why theirs isn't. Because as goes America, at this moment, as goes the world. So they had an unemployment rate, about 8%. They throw out Mubarak, throw him in prison. I don't know if he's died yet or not. I don't think so. I haven't heard. But it about gave the old man a heart attack anyway. And he was our ally, and we threw him under the bus. He was the ally of Israel, or at least neutral to Israel. And Israel liked Mubarak. He kept things stable over there, at least in terms of Egypt not attacking Israel. And we threw him under the bus and said, Riot, people, riot. We love the mob mentality. That's our arrogance now that we are falling as a client nation. So they replace this man by vote. Democracy at work. Isn't it beautiful? By vote of the masses of the mob, they voted in the Muslim Brotherhood. Mohammed al baratai is his name. And he turned out to be a dictator. So as soon as he was elected, he started taking away their constitution. He started doing away with the Supreme Court. He started doing away with what is tantamount to their Congress, their parliament. And he was going to rule as dictator. And he was a socialist. So he started nationalizing everything and taxing everything. So by the time he was finished, within two years, their unemployment rate was 12%. So things got worse for them. So now what are they doing? The same thing. Rioting in the streets. Frustrated people will always be frustrated. Because it's a mental attitude sin. They'll be frustrated during times of prosperity. They'll be extremely frustrated during times of adversity. And they'll never be happy. A frustrated person you cannot make happy. Don't try it. You'll just become frustrated. You see, you can't change evil, but evil can change you. So a right lobe that devises evil conspiracies. There are conspiracies in churches right now all across this country. Evil conspiracies against the authority of the pastor. And the pastor might be a fruit loop, but he's smarter usually than the congregation. Usually. He might not be, but he's still the authority. And if you are there as a sheep and you say to yourself, I'm just not getting enough here, just go to another church. Why do you have to get involved in a conspiracy to overthrow the institution that's already been set up? And if that pastor is a believer and he's got that church, that's where God put him. 
And I don't care if he doesn't know how to teach rebound, and I don't care if he doesn't even know how to give the gospel. That's where God put him as a believer with the gift of pastor-teacher. And he's the authority. In fact, the elected authority, as most churches, elect their pastor. And we as a client nation run around and we talk about our democracy, our democracy this, our democracy that. How great our democracy is, the whole world should be a democracy. Well, we turned, we pressed it, uh, Egypt to become a democracy and look what happened. It is not democracy that has made this country great. Democracy is when the mob just gets to rule. That's all. And we're not a democracy. We're not supposed to be. If we were a democracy, then why don't we just vote on everything? You see, we elect representatives. That's called a republic. We are a representative republic. You see, we don't vote on everything because we've got too much to do. Or we used to until the economy collapsed. Most people had too much to do. This country was hustle and bustle. So you elect a representative to do the will of the people while you conduct your business. And what they are supposed to do as your representative is keep out of your business and only protect your freedom, not violate it. And people are ignorant as to how they want how our forefathers wanted the Constitution to work, and they never, ever, ever once thought of us as a democracy. In fact, we were, things were a lot different. We were a republic in the truest of the sense of the word, but it always declines. There's never been a nation that's lasted forever. But there will, there will be one and that nation is called Yisrael, it will last forever. That is, after the tribulation, when the Lord returns, he will rule as king of king and lord of lords. He will be king of Israel and he will rule over them forever. And you say, what about the Cog and Magog revolution? And what about the blow up of the earth? There's going to be a new Jerusalem and a new heavens and a new earth and Jesus Christ will reign over Israel in the new heavens and the new earth. And then the dimensions of that are given in the Bible. And the dimensions of it, our cities, for example, we don't, uh, we have skyscrapers, but it's still not the same. There's, uh, the dimensions go, uh, you look at Columbus and you go down the street. And when you go down the street, uh, there's no elevator for your car to get into and then go up to a way up high to another part of the city. The city's going to go up. There'll be different parts of the city going up and down and all around in a cube. Those are the dimensions. Very large city. And the light for that city will be not the sun, but the Son of God. And we won't have to sleep, thank God. So he'll just light it up constantly. And we will be in perfect bliss and perfect happiness forever and ever and ever and ever. Even for those of you who are filled with pride and will die the sin face to face with death, you still possess God, God's righteousness and in his grace you will still be in that area. You won't have as many rewards. But you'll still be there. And you'll be happy. So a right lobe that devises evil conspiracies means there's always people who are frustrated and they usually take it out on authority because when authority makes them feel uncomfortable, what do they do? Well, they do everything they can to undermine that authority. Why? They become, they're full of pride. It's all about them. They become subjective and they Here's something that steps on their toes and they say, I'm not that way. 
or they realize that they are, so they have to justify it. And who are they going to blame? The person who made them look at themselves in the mirror and see how ugly they are. You can't take somebody and put their face in front of the mirror and say, you're ugly, or they'll get mad at you. Very mad. Well, I'm a pastor teacher. I do it every day. Anyone? Uh, there's people I've never met who have probably listened to on the internet and have gotten very mad. They don't even know who I am. But they hate my guts because I made them look in the mirror at how ugly they are. But that's my job. Pastor's job is not to run around and pat you on the back and tell you how sweet and nice you are because then he's lying. Even if you are a sweet and nice person, you have an old sin nature. And sometimes all that sweetness and light is just a cover-up. You know that Satan poses as an angel of light, don't you? Sweetness and kindness and brotherly love and peace to the world. And at the beginning of the tribulation, that's the way it's going to be. It's funny how everyone uh, looks toward the tribulation and they get all excited about it because of all the things that are going to happen during the tribulation, but they're not even going to be here. It's really ridiculous. And they get focused on one part of theology because it's popular, because it's entertaining, because it's outside of our frame of reference. So when things start to get bad, they always talk about the Lord coming. I've heard it my whole life. Well, the Lord is going to come. We don't know when. And he's going to take us away. But do you know that after we're taken out of here, the tribulation for three and a half years is filled with peace and hope and relative tranquility? And all the unbelievers cheer because the believers are gone. And finally, they can come up with their own master plan that they've always wanted to achieve. But because of us believers representing the Lord on the earth, they were never able to do so because there was always a client nation stopping them, such as the United States, stopping Satan's plans against Israel. Until now, now we're acting like the whole rest of the world against Israel. Oh, they talk out both sides of their mouth because they want the Jewish vote in this country. I can tell you right now, by the way, we're working in policy is against Israel. You don't know this. I know this because I read a lot of news. There was a debate when the president first took office. There was a debate in his council and they said, if Israel attacks Iran, which planes do we blow up? In other words, do we fight with Iran and help them? Or do we fight with Israel and help them? And that was an actual discussion. That's the insanity of what's going on. And we want to blame and point fingers at the person who's doing this, but he was duly elected by the mob. It's not his fault. He just ran for office. And all the people followed him. Not all, but a majority. What do you do? You blame him? You blame the American people? I don't. I blame believers because they've all become traitors to God and thus traitors to their own country. So, but I'm a believer. How am I a traitor to God? Do you know that when in the uh, epistles, when it mentions the Antichrist, it's talking about believers only? And most believers in this country are Antichrist. And they're turning unbelievers away from the truth of the gospel and they're turning believers away from the truth of the spiritual life 
because they are nosy, busybodies filled with pride. And every believer thinks most, most believers think because they believed in Jesus Christ, now they are an authority and they are a God. When they are a nothing, saved, they were simply saved by grace. Oh, they may say that, but they don't act like it. Let somebody do something in front of them that they don't like and they're going to make it known that, excuse me, they don't like it. And what is the verse that we studied yesterday? It said this. It said that uh, Jesus Christ made us free. And I told you that it sounded redundant, but I had to explain it to you. Jesus Christ making you free is the point of salvation. And then it said, for the sake of freedom, and that's after salvation, you are to live your spiritual life. And that spiritual life is to be lived freely. And what it means is, no one has a right to to tell you what to do, as in Colossians 2.16, in the manner of eating or drinking or anything else. Freedom. <clears throat> so, conspiracy always tries to undermine authority. It is not oriented to authority, and we are living in a society now that is not oriented at all toward authority. And there's always conspiracies against authority. And that makes us, though still a rich country, a very unhappy one. This sin also refers to children who undermine the authority of their parents. Children are culpable for sin against authority. That's why you're supposed to punish them. And these children who undermine the authority of their parents will in life undermine the, any authority over them. That's why in the Old Testament, if a child was unruly and he got to about the age of 12, and he was unruly, and he won't do what the parents say. And he gets involved in alcohol and drugs, and he's just running wild. And the parents have done everything to control the child. The parents had a right to take that child to court and say, he just won't listen to our authority. The court would evaluate the case. If it's found that that, that, that kid could not follow authority, he was executed. And that was God's plan for Israel put in the Bible as part of their law. This is what God told them to do. Why? Because that person is already a vessel of dishonor and they're going to be a criminal. They're going to turn into a serial killer or a thief or a rapist because they can't follow authority. So, God said, there's a simple solution to this. Kill them. Take out the cancer while it's young. You say, that sounds awful harsh. Well, talk to God about it. He wrote it to Israel. We don't do that today. We live under the laws of the United States of America. And I'm not necessarily advocating that because it's not part of our law today. I'm just telling you how God looked at it when he, Jesus Christ, ruled Israel before they had kings. You know, they were a theocracy before King Saul came along. And their king was Jesus Christ. It was a unique country in that way. And they didn't like it, and they wanted to be like all the other countries, and so they got a king, a man king, instead of having the Lord Jesus Christ as their king. How stupid, but that's the way people are. And Samuel definitely couldn't understand it. 
So he had an emotional breakdown, a nervous breakdown, and God had to come down and said, Samuel, stop it. This is what the people have chosen. And this is the way it's going to be. See, God respecting freedom. And he respects freedom and he puts it all into his plan. Because guess what? Jesus Christ is going to end up being their king anyway. <laughs> and by how? Through the seed of David, King David. See, the people rejected God's authority. God didn't care. Let them. I got a plan anyway. I already know what's going to happen anyway. So stop being upset, Samuel. Stop having a nervous breakdown. Stop weeping day and night. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Now get over yourself, Samuel. So God let them have a king. And he let them be taxed out the wazoo. And he let these conspiratorial type people know that having a king like all other countries isn't so great till they got King David who was a man after God's own heart. You see, the free will of man and the omnipotence of God coexist. That is his power. And he gives us our free will and whatever we do does not affect his plan one bit. His plan's going to happen. You can reject Bible doctrine. It doesn't affect his plan. It affects you. I could reject Bible doctrine, stop teaching, and go do something else. That's not going to affect God. It's going to affect me. His plan goes right on. He doesn't need us. Who do we think we are? We need him. That's grace. So that's what he was telling Samuel. Get over yourself. So children are, should also be punished when they undermine authority. And these cases of teenagers murdering, going into the court of law, and they have to decide, will they be tried as an adult or as a child? Will they go to juvenile or will they be executed? Our law is recognizing that, these, that the most vicious and the heinous of the crimes at least, they're going to treat a 16-year-old who murders just the same as a 21-year-old who murders, depending on which state. In Texas, if you're a 16-year-old and you murder someone, leave you me. You're going to die. <laughs> in California, well, you may go into juvenile. So the saying's true. Don't mess with Texas. In Texas, I live there. It is like its own country almost. That's why we have federalism. And while I teach you Bible doctrine and the heritage that you have spiritually, I might as well teach you about the heritage that you have as being a citizen of the United States in the fact that we're a client nation. Our forefathers, it was unbelievable. It was definitely in the plan of God, the way they came together, these geniuses, and devised a plan. And they were both unbeliever and believers doing it. They gave up everything to do this. They were mostly they were the aristocracy in our country, the very wealthy. So they had the most to lose by going into war with Great Britain. Then when it was over, we had to form our own government. So they all got together. And they began their long debate. And they didn't get to a constitution right away. They got to the Articles of Confederation. See, uh, they had the idea, we don't want any centralized government. In other words, we don't want a government in Washington, D.C. 
We want the states to have a union, but a union in commerce. But other than that, each state will pretty much run its own business. Well, that didn't work out too well because it was very hard to form an army, etc. Because one state would say, nah, we don't want to go to war. Another state would say, well, we'll give you a little bit. But very few wanted to give up any of their money for any type of war effort. They wanted to hang on to their money, their own money. And they considered themselves their own little nation. South Carolina considered itself its own little nation. So much so, it started a civil war. Hotheads. I don't think it's changed much from generation to generation either, at least amongst a lot of them. Ever watch Jerry Springer? See? Hotheads. And most of the people you see on there, well, never mind. They're from all over the country. We're all a pile of crap as far as depravity of man. So we, we started out that way, and then they finally got together and said, okay, we've got to get serious about this and make a country. So what did they do? They split power many, many, many ways. Why? Because they understood the depravity of man, and they understood that those in power want more and more and more and more and more power. So they split it up into all different ways so that each part of the government would fight against the other for power and try to keep things balanced to where the people keep their freedom. Right now, the executive branch is grabbing for power here, there, and everywhere, and we just sit back and let it happen. But that's not the way our Constitution was designed. We were designed to limit power by having in the federal government the executive branch, which is headed by the president, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. We are to have the legislative branch, which is composed of two sets of powers. The Congress, which is made up of representatives from smaller areas, districts, and the Senate, in which each state no matter population, no matter size, gets two senators. What, what's that bring into it? States' rights. Because South Carolina has two senators, and so does New York. And New York has a far bigger population than South Carolina, yet South Carolina gets to represent itself with two senators and hold the same power in terms of politics as New York. Genius plan. And that's not democracy at all. Democracy would be, well, that's not fair. There's more people in New York. They should have more senators because they got more people. But the republic says, no, we can't have mob rule. So there are two senators from each state, all 57 of them, no, all 50 states. So we have 100 senators. And the congressmen are apportioned by district. And that changes from time to time by gerrymandering and all those things. But that was all set up in the Constitution. They knew it would happen. They wanted it to happen. You say, what's gerrymandering? Uh, the party in power moves districts around so they can retain the power. But it's allowed. And uh, so you have within the legislative branch, sometimes the Congress fighting against the Senate in the same branch of government. In other words, everybody says, we need to get something done in Washington. Our forefathers said, you don't need to get anything done in Washington. That's the way we set it up. We don't want anything to happen. We want them to fight against each other constantly so that they never can put their power over the people. 
Besides, they are the representatives of the people, not the other way around. They are the servants of the people, not the other way around. You can't imagine the imag There's been no country like this ever in the history of the world outside of Israel. Ever has there been something so ingenious, so wonderful in terms of a heritage of freedom. Nothing like it. And we're ruining it because believers aren't living their spiritual life. You believers who aren't living your spiritual life, you're ruining this country, destroying it. It's your fault. You're destroying your national heritage and you've already left your heritage spiritually far behind. And you make me sick. Traitor. And then there's the judicial branch. And in that branch, you have district courts that go all the way up to the Supreme Court. So it was split three ways. So that uh, the legislative branch, well, they have two places. And the power of the purse, by the way, was given to Congress where there are representatives. That is, they apportion the money. When you see the national debt as high as it is, everybody says, I'll blame the president. Congress has the power of the purse, and they can cut it off. And Congress right now is ruled by Republicans. They're not going to cut off any money. They want to get reelected. That's how corrupt it's gotten. Oh, there's some with some spine, but it's only because they live in districts where the people have their heads screwed on straight. But in a lot of districts, everybody's living off the state, so they're not going to want to cut off that money. The Congress right now has the power to stop Obamacare by defunding it. You say, no, they don't because it's already been written into the law that it's got to be done this way because it's an entitlement now just like Social Security and blah, blah, blah. You're wrong. They have the right to shut off Social Security. <laughs> now, they won't do it, so don't even get worried. You might want to get worried because it's going to happen one day anyway we're going to go broke, period, over and out. And uh, the people in power don't care because what keeps them in power is to make sure the money goes back. And what a stupid system. Well, not really. Not in terms of politics because half the people don't even pay taxes. So there's always going to be that political base. And it's up to 49% of the American people receive some kind of aid from the government. Now in Israel, they had a poor tax. And I'm not against a system of hand up, but hands out that goes on and on forever is not way, the way it was meant. It's to be a hand up. Give you a little help until you can find a job, etc. Except we pay for that anyway when we have a job. It's called unemployment. Then they have welfare for those who might not have skills, etc. So they give them money, say, go get, go get some skills. Here's a little money to, to go to school, get your skills. Do they do it? No, they just sit on their butts. But hand up, all for it. Disability, all for it. Compassionate society should be. Say, so what about charity? All for that too. But they had a poor tax that the Lord imposed because uh, he wanted there to always be a flow of money for those down and out, the, the really down and out during good times and bad. 
and he centralized it, and he's Jesus Christ, and he can do that. But we have a Congress that, control, that has the power of the purse, and he who has the money has the power, period. Now, the president walks around like he's all-powerful. He holds a lot of political clout, yes. He, he seems to scare those people into line, yes. And this has happened since Roosevelt, scaring Congress into line. You know how you do that? <laughs> you need to learn about a man named, uh, oh, what was his name? CIA director, very famous one, FBI director, the very famous FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover had, he ran the country. When the president wanted to say something that he didn't want J. Edgar Hoover to hear, he'd have to walk out on the White House lawn and whisper it to somebody. Not even the president had the power. Why? Well, he was the greatest blackmailer of all human history. So much so that the FBI's budget was not even listed. It was unknown. So it's been happening in this country a long time. So you know why don't want you want to know why a lot of poli of Congress is spineless and won't stop a lot of this agenda? They know too much about them. They know everything about their life. You say I don't believe that. That's that sounds uh, like you're a nut and you're just worried about. Uh, Everybody's spying on people. You're paranoid. No, it's part of our history. J. Edgar Hoover did it. Part of history. And if you think it's not happening now with the technology we have, you're the one who's silly. They keep an eye on every one of those congressmen and senators. And then if they start to say, Mr. President, I don't like this president says, uh, he calls up the FBI director and says, uh, you need to go talk to this congressman, so-and-so. He goes in there with pictures of him at the strip club or a phone conversation he doesn't want his wife to hear. And all of a sudden, he's compliant. Well, I think maybe this health care plan will work. He'll sell out his own country because he's scared of his own behind. And that's a traitor. But what's more of a traitor? The believer who does not execute the protocol plan of God. The believer who does not listen to Bible doctrine because it bores them. They would rather be entertained. Well, you entertain yourself right into poverty. You want the freedom of entertainment? Like the Lord said, and a lot of you would say, I wish you wouldn't talk so much about the country going down and just stick with the word. It is the word. Have you ever heard of Jeremiah? I'm sure people told Jeremiah, I wish you would stop talking about Israel going under. It hasn't happened for 40 years. You've been talking about this for 40 years, and we're getting tired of hearing you talk about it. Poor Jeremiah kept on going. Now I'm going to keep on going. And if you think there's something wrong with me talking about how the fact that believers are failing is ruining this country, then you're the one who's wrong in the head. If you, if you have thoughts that way, you're going to end up in a Pentecostal church. Every client nation must have its pastors that bang and shout out in the wilderness to try to wake people up. Otherwise, it ceases being a client nation. What makes it a client nation is a pivot. And we happen to be one, so privileged. Yet we, people can be so snarky. And in pride, try to tell the preacher how to do his business. Don't talk so much about that. I'll talk about it all I want. You don't have to listen. Some people will. The ones that are right in the head, who understand the issue, 
who, uh, the ones who have an imagination that is large enough to understand what, what's going to happen to the future and what could happen within the next 10 years. Right now we sit fat, dumb, and happy. Tomorrow, it could be a total and complete mess. We could, the economy could collapse completely. We could go into a war that we start losing. We could be nuked. By an, we could be nuked by an electro-impulse bomb and not even know where it came from. You say, oh, that sounds crazy. They said that before 9-11, too. And all that took were some crazy people with some box cutters. And it brought this nation to its knees. Not a whole army. Not even an army. Not an army at all. A few crazy people hopped up on meth, got on je some jets, slit some people's throats, and brought the greatest country in the world right to its knees. Don't tell me what to preach. I know what can happen. I've seen it happen. I wept on 9-11 and I don't want to weep like that again. I didn't weep bitterly though. These politicians who've sold out the country, God already says they will weep bitterly, but the honorable will weep as it were in silence. It's not good. It's not a good time at all. And it's because people don't understand freedom and they don't un and it's because believers don't understand these verses. Believers have no clue about sin and what it is. Believer most believers, I would say 90% of believers do not know that gossip is sin. They think it's just fine. And that's horrid because it's the worst, part of the worst of the sins. So as a result of conspiracy, oftentimes... There are acts of civil disobedience and activism. Do not become an activist. When you hear me get charged up and say, believers get with Bible doctrine, that's exactly what I mean. I don't mean believers get out in the street and start shouting. That isn't going to do anything. As I told you the other night, that symptom shadow boxing. You can't change anything through the power of the flesh. You can make things worse, but you can't make them better only God can make things better. And how does he do it? He can do it through the magnetism of your spiritual life. What do I mean by that? Because you have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the power of Bible doctrine. And that can turn the world upside down. We just don't have enough people who understand its importance. What does feet that run rapidly to evil mean? Feet running rapidly to evil refers to criminality, destruction of property, murder, destruction of life. And in fact, feet running rapidly to evil it really means that they justify all of these acts of civil disobedience through some form of crusade. There are all kinds of crusades in this country today because, excuse me, this country is filled with arrogant people. There's a crusade against 32 ounce soft drinks. 32 ounce that's insanity. There's a crusade against salt. That's insanity. It's already been proven. The CDC, which is a very which which is government controlled and uh, wants to control people's lives, had to come out and admit that salt is not an issue, except in extraordinary quantities, of course. 
I mean, you can't drink salt water from the sea. You'll dehydrate. But they say as much salt as the normal person would like to eat, they're not going to want it too salty. They're going to, probably going to eat just what they need. And the CDC says that's not a problem. It really doesn't cause hypertension, which is high blood pressure. It really doesn't cause these things. They had to admit it. Yet there's still a crusade against salt in New York City. Crusade against the fast food industry. Crusade against drilling for oil. Crusade against everything that makes us prosperous. That's the communist crusade. Then you have on the other side, believers getting involved in crusades that are meaningless. Walking around with their signs, trying to get rid of abortion clinics. Not one person has been saved by reading that stupid sign. Why aren't you out giving the gospel? Probably because you don't know it. You wouldn't know how to give it. You'd be telling them to invite Christ into your heart, which isn't even in the Bible. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. Believe it. The only verse that they could slightly twist would be found in Revelation chapter 3. I believe it's chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He who answers, I will enter and dine with him. You know that the first part of Revelation is written to believers only, people who are already saved, people who are already Christians. That is a rebound verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> discipline. Warning discipline first. Then if you don't open the door, rebound. Intensive discipline. Then if you don't open the door through 1 John 1, 9, <laughs> sin face to face with death. That's what that verse means. And it's not a salvation verse. And people get so confused because they look at the whole Bible as a, this Bible will save me. And everything in it is how to be saved. No, it's not. There are parts in it that tell the unbeliever how to be saved, like John 3.16. Most of the Bible is written to the believer only because the gospel message is short. And people get so confused. They think 1 John 1.9 is for the unbeliever. You have to be saved. You have to go to God and confess your sins and tell Him you're sorry which is wrong even in the Christian sense. That is, if you're already a believer. You don't tell God you're sorry. He knows you're sorry. You were sorry when you were born. I was sorry when I was born. I'm still sorry. But I don't tell God I'm sorry for it. I do what the Scripture says if we name our sins. And in the German Bible... It says, if we only name our sins. It makes it very specific. And it is indicated that way. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That's for the believer only. And people don't even know that verse. And if you don't know that verse, you'll never live your spiritual life. Oh, you'll talk about the Lord. How you love the Lord. You don't love the Lord. You don't know the Lord. Oh, you may be saved, but you don't know any Bible doctrine. None. You can't. You don't have the power of the Spirit. If you don't have the power of the Spirit, you can't understand these things. Even if you learn them academically, they would be, mean nothing to you. It's the power of the Spirit that converts it, converts the energy of Bible doctrine. You see, a lake has no power. A lake is a lake. 
Well, let's say you have a lake with a dam. The dam's turned off. Well, that damn lake has no power. You have to turn the damn dam on. And so, what happens? You have to let the flow of water go through. That produces energy by the spinning of generators, etc. That water has no power just sitting there. It can have a dam, still have no power. You as a believer are indwelled with God the Holy Spirit, but you can have absolutely no power. That's like a lake with a dam that's not having the water flow through it and turn the turbines. So you must be filled with God the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? 1 John 1, 9. If you don't know what 1 John 1, 9 is, you have the potential for power because you have the indwelling, but you don't use it. You're like a wasteful government that builds a huge dam, like the Hoover Dam, and never turns it on, never lets the water flow through. Just lets the water sit there, powerless. Imagine if we'd done that. Wouldn't make any sense, would it? Build a Hoover Dam and just leave it there. That's what believers do all the time. Jesus Christ builds for them salvation. They accept salvation. And that's as far as they go. And they just sit there without the filling of the Spirit. And they become stagnant. And it's awful. They don't care to learn about 1 John 1 9. They don't want to hear it. It's too grace oriented. They want to do something. They want to get out there and turn the turbine themselves. And they couldn't turn it if they wanted to. I've seen those turbines in the uh, dam at the Hoover Dam. I've seen them. Man can't turn those turbines by himself. Doesn't have the power. But these believers run around in arrogance and think they have the power on their own to on their own get, gain the forgiveness of God by doing something they think would impress God. It would be like trying to impress that generator. You couldn't move it one bit. You're a fool. An arrogant, prideful, pusillanimous, little bitty peon who's a fool. You'd be locked up if you went down to the Hoover Dam and tried to turn them things yourself. So you're crazy. Well, we can't lock up these believers because they're stupid. It's their choice and their freedom. But they're traitors. They're bringing this country down. You have to be filled with the Spirit, and that's the power of the spiritual life. And they are options. You're given the freedom. You have the option to turn that dam on, as it were, let the water flow through, and turn the turbine, and make the power. The turning of the turbine would be tantamount to taking in Bible doctrine as the dam takes in the water. So now the turbine's turning. Now there's energy. Now there's power. Lots of it. And this country has a lot of power underground called oil or even natural gas. More than Saudi Arabia. Actually, they now know that we have more than the Middle East. And this is something I've always known. This is something my pastor knew in the 70s. We have more power right here in the United States than anywhere in the world, more than in Russia, more than in the Middle East. But our president says we can't make that pipeline because it's only going to create five jobs, he said snarkingly. He knows better than that. But he's not the problem. 
problem is believers aren't getting with the spiritual life. If they were, we wouldn't be going through this third cycle of discipline. Even if we were to get good government suddenly, the country would still fall because if the pivot doesn't grow. But if the pivot doesn't grow, we're not going to get good government anyway. So that's what it means, feet running rapidly to evil. It's some kind of arrogant crusade in which you justify your civil disobedience. You justify ruining the property of an abortion clinic. You say, why are you going so long? I was supposed to do two anyway, so I was cramming it in here. So let me uh, finish it up by going through the rest rather quickly. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that sh shed innocent blood. Verse 18, a right lobe that devises evil conspiracies, feet that run rapidly to evil. Verse 19, a false witness who utters lies, he who swords discord and strife between the brethren. Now, a false witness who utter lies, that has to do with the system of jurisprudence. And in our system of jurisprudence, we have something called uh, when you tell a lie, uh, you're, you, first of all, you put your hand on the Bible and you give an oath, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And we have that in our system because without the truth and the justice system, there is no justice. And if you lie, that's called perjury. But we have become so lax with perjury that it's rarely ever, ever prosecuted. We let them lie. And that's wrong. We should be vigilant about perjury. Perjury corrupts the whole system. That's why it is part of the worst sin to lie in a court of law because it ruins freedom, understand? Freedom. It is one of the worst sins to lie of an, in a court of law, to slander someone just because you are angry and bitter and frustrated, and to try to make someone else's life a living hell because you use the justice system by lying. Well, guess what? There's a Supreme Court of Heaven, and that believer can take you there, and justice will be done. But we're supposed to, in our system, have it. And they had it in Israel, too. In fact, Israel had the greatest system of jurisprudence. And God, in his infinite wisdom, says lying in court is one of the worst sins. Because it makes it impossible to bring out the facts in the court of law. If you let people just lie and lie, and they get caught in the lie and nothing is done to them, it's going to keep happening. Happens all the time in this country. Frivolous lawsuits, people lying right and left, all for greed, or in divorce cases, people lying just to hurt the other person, and it happens both ways. The man tries to hurt the woman, so he lies in court about her. Or the woman tries to hurt the man, so she lies in court about him. And they get caught in the lie and nothing happens. They already have their system. They're already going to do it the way they're going to do it. Period. They don't really care what you have to say. Why? Because they don't want to deal with a case of perjury. But God says it should be dealt with. So since it's not dealt with that much anymore in this country, we have to leave it all in the Supreme Court of Heaven. He'll deal with it. Sowing discord and strife between the brethren refers to playing one person against another. You should know what that's all about. We've studied it before. So those are the worst of the sins. That part of them. And then, let's see, verse 19. Yep, that's it. Those are the top seven. 
the worst sins, and of course murder, that's self-explanatory. And why are they the worst sins, you say? Well, just as we noted on the last verse, a false witness who utters lies violates freedom, uh, causing strife between brethren could destroy the freedom of a friendship because you're jealous of a friendship, you play one person off the other and destroy their friendship, you're getting your nose in their business and their freedom to have a friend because you're jealous. All of these sins are the worst sins because you're putting your place in the place of God. And God allows us our freedom. But when you're full of pride, you don't allow anyone freedom. Anytime you're filled with pride, jealousy, envy, pettiness, you have put yourself in God's official judge robe. He lets you do it. But as I said, he's going to pull out that Louisville bat and beat you silly. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.